Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first of the 2024 series of Society of Army Historical Research talks. Um, we've had a very good sign up again um, for this talk, uh, and I can see uh, the numbers uh, going up as people sign in. Uh, for those that are regular attenders of these sessions, you'll know that I will speak for a couple of minutes um, just to give the latecomers a chance to enter the room, but also to explain to you how Demio, the platform that we use, works. Uh, and so for those old hands here, please forgive me if I'm going over old news, but there are always one or two who are new to these talks. Um, the chat box is open. Please feel free to type in there and um, tell us who you are and where you're watching this from. Demio works through your broadband connection. So um, if you are having any issues this evening, either with your audio or your video feed, um, the, then there are a number of what I call immediate action drills that you can take to remedy that situation. Most people will go through the whole talk with no problems whatsoever. But if you do have a problem with your audio or video, then the first IA drill that I suggest to you to take is to refresh your page. And for those that don't know how to refresh a page, in the top left corner of most browser windows, you click on that, that is what will happen. That is what will happen if you lose your broadband connection, which is just what happened to me then. And surprisingly, I had the engineer out today to sort out my, my, uh, my router. Anyway, refresh your page. The second IA drill that you can take is to um, close down the browser window and come back in using the same connect, uh, link that you were issued with to join this talk. Those two IA drills normally sort out any problems that you might be experiencing. And the third IA drill that you can undertake, um, if you have access to a different browser, so I am talking to you through the Chrome browser at the moment, but I also have Safari, um, I can switch browsers. Uh, and Debio works with Microsoft uh, Safari, with Chrome, with Firefox, and with Microsoft Edge. Okay, that's enough about the IA drills. On the top right hand corner of your screen, you can see a gray lozenge with four buttons. Um, if you don't want to be distracted by the chat box, if you click the second button, button from the left, sorry, the, the fourth button from the left, uh, that will close the chat box. And if you click on it again, it will reopen your chat box. If you click on the double arrow, southwest to northeast, um, that will bring your screen to full size. And if you click on it again, it will bring it back down to the window, the browser window. Okay, I think that's enough by way of explanation. Uh, we are going to shortly publish the full program for the year, uh, but we have uh, speakers for every month now between now and January and December. Uh, and our next speaker's uh, date has not yet been agreed, but in March, it will be on the 21st of March when Adam Prime will be talking to us. I'm gonna ask our speaker this evening to, to join me on the stage now so that I can introduce him to you all. Um, Interestingly, our speaker this evening had to travel to the UK to study to find his wife. Um, who was most disappointed, I, he tells me, to discover, because she's American, that she had also travelled to the UK to study to find her husband. Um, different parts of America and different Oxbridge uh, uh, universities. Uh, our speaker this evening uh, went to the University College. Uh, Oxford uh, 
where he is um, sponsor and his supervisor for his uh, dissertation, sorry, his doctorate rather, was Nicholas Wodger, uh, a famous naval historian. And that gives you a clue that our speaker this evening is by profession a naval historian, but one that understands the army and is very passionate on ensuring that naval historians and, and uh, army historians at least have a, a conversation with each other uh, in which they start to understand their different points of view. He got the very prestigious Clarendon Scholarship. Now I know uh, that these scholarships for um, studies at the Oxford Colleges are uh, pretty difficult to get. So I'd like now to introduce to you Evan Wilson. Evan, I'm going to leave the stage and I will come back when you've finished. Thanks very much. Uh, I hope my audio is clear and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Dudley, for the introduction. Um, as he mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm here um, as an ambassador from Naval History. Uh, I follow, therefore, closely in the footsteps of Roger Knight, who I'm very pleased to see in the audience. Hello, Roger, uh, who similarly has uh, braved this, this divide between naval and, and military history. Uh, and so I, I will say, full disclosure, I'm coming at this from a naval history background, but I hope that I have some interesting things to say to you about uh, the Navy, but also about, of course, the Army. I will be speaking about, about both over the course of the talk. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to share my slides and, and get going. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, and Dudley, I encourage you to say something in the chat if none of this is working as it should. Thanks. Okay. Uh, on September 14th, 1812, Napoleon's Grand Army entered Moscow. Just over a year and a half later, on March 31st, 1814, Tsar Alexander's Russian Army entered Paris. That's one of the great stories in European history. Napoleon's winter retreat gets all the press, but there was a lot more to it than that. The best single book on it is not the book I'm here to tell you about. It's a surprise. I'm giving a book talk for someone else. Read Dominic Levin, Russia Against Napoleon. But I bring up Russians in Paris because I think it's worth pausing here, right at the start, to say that the mental image of 100,000 Russians entering Paris is striking, right? It causes you to stop and think for a moment about what that might have looked like about why, if you were a historian writing about these events in the Cold War especially, you might have been even more unsettled by the implications of it. Uh, today, of course, we have no reasons to think about large Russian armies marching through Europe. Uh, but let's get back to my story. Tsar Alexander's soldiers had been fighting Napoleon for years all across Europe, and now they had their chance to take revenge on the French capital. Alexander, to his credit, recognized that if he let the army sack the city and rape the inhabitants, Paris would rise against him and there would be no chance of a lasting peace. So he insisted on good behavior and on limiting the impact of his army on the citizens at least as much as was possible. His compassion extended in one additional direction uh, to Napoleon, who was watching his capital fall from his palace in the suburbs. Alexander proclaimed in public that Napoleon should keep all the trappings of monarchy that he had acquired over the last decade, but instead of ruling France, he should rule the small island of Elba off the coast of Italy. This is, by any measure, one of the worst decisions in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and I say as much in the book I'm actually here to talk to you about. Tsar Alexander blew it. So too did the person the Allies put on the French throne to replace Napoleon, the Bourbon Louis XVIII, brother of the executed Louis XVI. But there's another missing actor in this story, and it's the one that supposedly had the most power among all the Allies, Britain. Why did the British allow Alexander to put Napoleon on Elba? The answer is that the British made mistakes at every level. These mistakes were wrapped up in the challenges of war termination and coalition management, and I'll try to be as fair as possible given that context. But the bottom line is that Britain failed diplomatically, strategically, operationally, and tactically. Diplomatically, the person responsible for representing British interests among the Allies in the spring of 1814 was a foreign secretary by Count Castlereagh. When the Russians entered Paris, he was in Dijon with the Austrian Prince Menedek. Instead of rushing to Paris to advise the Tsar on how best to handle the dismantling of Napoleon's regime, Castlereagh and Metternich decided to stay in Dijon. They claimed that the roads to Paris were impassable, 
which was a lie. What they were really doing was letting the czar bear the brunt of the diplomatic challenges. It was better, they thought, to have the czar manage the risk of occupying the enemy capital and installing a new government than for the British or the Austrians to take on that challenge. Then, once the czar had made the uh, Elba decision public, Castlereagh and Metternich failed to convince him to change his mind, deciding that it wasn't worth the friction it would cause to the alliance. Strategically, the British failed because they neglected to consider the high likelihood that war would resume if Napoleon was not kept on Elba. As soon as the guns fell silent in Toulouse, where Wellington was with his army, British strategic attention turned to the ongoing War of 1812 with the United States. The war had started poorly for the British, but despite prioritizing the fight against Napoleon, by early 1814, they'd managed to enforce an effective blockade of the east coast of the US. Now that Napoleon was defeated, the goal was to bring the war to a successful conclusion by attacking on three fronts. The first offensive was in the north, aimed at Niagara. In the mid-Atlantic, an amphibious task force came up the Chesapeake to attack Washington. And in the south, a second amphibious force gathered to attack New Orleans. Each offensive required troops and ships to be redeployed from Europe to the US. In practice, that meant that the British had to dismantle the Mediterranean fleet, which was usually the largest or second largest command in the Navy. And in turn, that meant that there were far fewer ships on station to keep Napoleon on Elba. Operationally, the British failed because nobody knew the plan. Castlereagh told the British commissioner on Elba that he was not Napoleon's jailer, even though everyone in Europe assumed that he was. Napoleon was in fact the sovereign of Elba and not subject to British control. There was no ship tasked with keeping Napoleon on Elba. Instead, three consecutive commanders in chief in the Mediterranean just sent a sloop wandering by every so often. Meanwhile, because Napoleon was sovereign of an island nation, he had an army and a navy. It was just one sloop and a few hundred men, but that's all he needed to lead. His power was his charisma, not the number of bayonets he had on the island. Tactically, the British blew at least two opportunities to intercept Napoleon before he got to France. When Napoleon prepared his return, the captain of the sloop showed up at just the right time to stop him, but he failed to notice the obvious preparations for departure. Then he intercepted Napoleon at sea, but for reasons nobody has ever figured out, and I didn't manage to, he misidentified his squadron and let him go. Meanwhile, the British commissioner on Elba was absent. He was on the mainland visiting his mistress, who was also probably Napoleon's spy during the crucial month of February, 1815. The point of listing all these failures is to say that Britain was at least as responsible as the czar and the inept Louis XVIII for Napoleon's return. The implication of that then is that the greatest victory in the history of the British army, Waterloo, should never have happened. And indeed it was to a large degree Britain's fault that Wellington had to slap together a crappy army at the last minute and beat Napoleon in the field. 65,000 men died that day in June 1815, and more died in the days before and after it because the Allies failed to figure out how to end the war when they had the chance. Here, then, are the challenges of war termination as demonstrated by the British in 1814 and 1815. First, they prioritized coalition politics over all else. They deferred to the Tsar out of a combination of cowardice and a desire to see their ally, but also possible future rival, Russia, bear the largest political cost for the peace settlement. Any outcome other than shooting Napoleon was going to require shipping him somewhere. And that meant that Britain, as the major naval power, needed to have a say in where he meant, went. Notice that after Waterloo, they didn't make the same mistake. Napoleon was clearly a prisoner and they sent him to one of the remotest islands on earth. Second, the British were unwilling to admit that they had made a mistake. Castlereagh in particular seemed more interested in going with the flow than with stopping the momentum for war termination. He was understandably afraid, I think, that if he threw up any barriers to the end of the war, the whole situation might collapse. But he should have, listened, have insisted to the Tsar, as many of the, their contemporaries pointed out in the moment, that Elba was not a good solution. Once Elba was decided, the third mistake the British made was not communicating internally from one branch of the government to another about what the plan was. The Navy and the Army turned their attention to the U.S. The Foreign Office did not advertise the fact that Napoleon was sovereign of Elba, but that Europe thought he was in jail. And the commanders on the spot didn't realize that they had to treat him like a prisoner, even if he wasn't. Instead, they visited Elba to see the great celebrity and hosted parties for him on their ships. Napoleon, in turn, gave them bottles of wine and diamond-encrusted snuff boxes. 
Finally, as Clausewitz taught us, even the ultimate outcome of war is not always to be regarded as final. It's not surprising he'd say that since he was a veteran in the Napoleonic Wars and was writing his great work in their aftermath. The Allies failed to realize that a war is not over if the defeated side refuses to accept that they are defeated. Waterloo, I think, has tended to obscure this obvious point. Because it's one of the great battles in world history, because it seems to have been decisive, whatever that means, and because the two greatest generals of their generation finally met each other in the field, historians haven't, I think, been willing to take a step back and ask why it had to happen at all. That's what I try to do in my new book, uh, but that's just one part of it. Uh, my broader point, and the one thing I hope that this audience takes away from this talk, is that when you look closely at Britain in 1815, you uncover a country that's hanging on by a thread. Not only did it score a series of own goals to let Napoleon back in the game in 1815, but it was also broke on the verge of revolution at home and globally overstretched. Many in this audience will know that those three great offenses against the US that I mentioned and that the British stripped forces from Europe to launch all stalled out. First in the North, then at Baltimore, and finally at New Orleans. As I hope to show you today, when Wellington said that his victory at Waterloo was, quote, a near run thing, he could also have been talking about the wars in general and Britain's experience of the post-war decade. I do not share the opinion of the uh, recently deceased former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, who said in his doctoral dissertation in 1815 that Britain was, that, sorry, his doctoral dissertation, that Britain in 1815 was so powerful that it could, quote, fashion a new interpretation of reality. Kissinger was writing in the 1950s, not 1815, and he was clearly looking to the Vienna Settlement of 1815 as a model for the US-led post-World War II global order. And he's not the only one who's looked to Britain in 1815 as a model for the United States, because Britain in 1815 is often shorthand for a global superpower. John Eikenberry used it this way to argue that US policy after 1991 should be, like Britain after 1815, characterized by what he calls strategic restraint. That might be good policy advice, but as I show in the book, that's not a good characterization of British policy after 1815. Lots of surveys of 19th century world and European history like to use hyperbolic language to describe British power in 1815. What my book shows is that that may have been true of Britain in the middle of the 19th century at the height of the Pax Britannica, but it wasn't true for the decade after 1815. Britain had barely won the wars at the second attempt, and it was saddled with massive debts Roughly, roughly comparable to the debts incurred to fight World War II. The Army and the Navy had to be cut way back to get the budget under control, with the result that Britain proved incapable of projecting power in the post-war decade. It backed down in confrontations with the US, it allowed piracy to flourish in the Caribbean, and it acted with restraint in Europe because it had no other choice. Excuse me. Britain in 1815 was not the US in 1991 at the unipolar moment. It was suffering from the high transition costs of bringing more than two decades of war to an end. And that's what my book is about, those transition costs. That's why it's called The Horrible Peace. The research question that drives the book is, what happened when soldiers and sailors came home? The book breaks that question down into two parts. When did soldiers and sailors come home? And then what happened when they did? That means that the first seven chapters are concerned with the mechanics of demobilization, the false starts and mistakes of war termination, and British strategy during the war's final stages and in its aftermath. What you heard at the beginning was taken from chapter five, for example. The second part surveys the experiences of soldiers and sailors as they came home and how British society reacted to them. So part one is demobilization and British strategy, and part two is demobilization and British society. Veterans, I argue in the book, allow us to gain a much more complete picture of Britain at this time in its history because they connect those two parts. We can't understand veterans' experience of the post-war world until we understand the when, how, and why of their arrival back in Britain. And that in turn depended on the course of the wars, which is to say British and allied strategy against Napoleon and the United States. Then when veterans arrived back in Britain, they were on the front lines of the post-war fights, literally. Discharged veterans participated in riots, Soldiers still in service suppressed those riots, sometimes wearing the medals that they won in the wars. Looking at veterans allows me to examine the government's role in society, the government's obligations to those who served, and what British people expected the long-awaited peace to look like. 
All those reasons are why the book is with UMass, which has a series called Veterans. So for the rest of the talk today, I'm going to try to illustrate some of the book's themes. I'm not summarizing every chapter by the book, if you want that. Uh, there's a flyer that Dudley can put in the chat uh, that gives you a discount code for international shipping or uh, to give you a discount code at, at checkout. So you can uh, check that out um, at, uh, maybe at the end of the talk. Uh, you can also follow along on the blog that I started about the book, uh, which is evanmwilson.substack.com, which tries to draw contemporary parallels to highlight some of the more unusual uh, stories from the book. The details are on the screen, and I'm happy to share them if you send me an email. So instead of going through chapter by chapter, uh, to illustrate some of the themes, you're going to hear the stories of three very different veterans. Again, the book isn't organized around them like this. But I hope that by doing so here, I can give you a sense of the kind of questions that I'm asking and the approaches that I use in the book. Also, I hope it's more interesting to follow individual stories and to hear me recapping chapters that you can read for yourself. Uh, our first veteran is not actually a veteran, to be clear. Uh, Sir Robert Peel, he is well known to all of you, I'm sure. Uh, he was prime minister twice, as he, and he famously led the charge to repeal uh, the Corn Laws. More on that in a moment. He was a divisive figure and the subject of perhaps the most aggressive graffiti I've ever seen. So on the right there, that's at Christchurch uh, College in Oxford, and it's made with nails, uh, not paint. Uh, so that took some time. That was, that was aggressive. Uh, but I'm going to talk about him before he was famous enough to cause someone to go to all that trouble. Uh, Peel was born in 1788, a year before the French Revolution. His father had made a fortune in textile manufacturing and bought a seat in Parliament with his winnings. Peel went to Harrow and then, ironically, to Christchurch. <laughs> that was as elite an education as was possible in the early 19th century. A few weeks after he turned 21 in 1809, his father arranged for him to get a seat in the Commons. It was a corrupt borough, so only a few dozen people could vote in his constituency, and most of them were bought and paid for by the Duke of Portland. Uh, thus began one of the most distinguished careers in British political history. Now, you might be wondering why I'm talking about Peel in the context of telling you stories about veterans. After all, he never served in the military. Technically then he wasn't a veteran, but his life until age 27 was shaped by war. He was one when the Bastille fell, five when Britain joined the war. By the time he entered parliament, Britain had been fighting a global war for more than 15 years. Revolution and war were all that Peel knew. So I think it's worth looking at Peel with that in mind because it helps us see that everyone in Britain in 1815 had had their lives shaped by the wars and the younger generations in particular knew nothing but war. Peel was a rising star for the government towards the end of the wars. He was talented, rich, a good speaker, and a good administrator. In May 1812, the prime minister, Spencer Percival, was assassinated in the lobby of the House of Commons, famously the only assassination of a British prime minister in history. As an aside, Americans are astonished when you tell them that. We have a nasty habit of killing our presidents, but never mind. Percival's replacement was Lord Liverpool, and it was Liverpool who gave Peel his first step onto the leadership ladder by asking him to become Chief Secretary for Ireland at the age of 24. Another irony of Peel's career is that he was a member of the administration that's, that installed the same Corn Laws that he later repealed, as I mentioned earlier. So what were the Corn Laws? Well, in 1813, agricultural prices dropped quickly, partly as a product of the onset of demobilization. Feeding Britain's sailors especially, the Navy, as Roger Knight has written about, was a major player in the agricultural market. Feeding the sailors had helped to keep agricultural prices high, but now that the Navy was beginning to sell off its surplus flour, uh, the, the prices began to fall. Ministers assumed that the price was likely to keep falling in the peace, with the result that farmers and landowners would be economically devastated. If prices were allowed to fall too quickly, widespread bankruptcies would jeopardize Britain's ability to feed itself again. Foreign wheat from the reopening of Europe might prove to be cheaper to import, which would not only undercut the domestic market, but also, if the war resumed, expose Britain to the same kind of economic warfare that Napoleon had attempted with the continental system. Remember that we know that the wars finally ended in 1815, but they didn't know that. They didn't know that the wars weren't going to resume a great power war in, in Europe for decades or a century, depending on how you count. So that's all the background to the introduction of the Corn Law of 1815, which set the price at which imports of foreign wheat, barley, oats, and other grains were allowed. Corn was a catch-all term for all those grains. It wasn't the first of its kind, as there had been a recent version of the Corn Laws in 1804, but the new edition was met with unprecedented animosity from the people who purchased 
rather than grew the wheat. After all, propping up the price of wheat makes bread more expensive. So unsurprisingly, London erupted in rioting and it wasn't random violence. Rioters targeted the houses of members of parliament who were known to support the bill. In one case, they hanged the MP in effigy and assaulted his servants who tried to board up the house and get soldiers to help. The soldiers initially fired blanks to the crowd to get the crowd to disperse. But as soon as the crowd figured out that they were blanks, uh, that stopped working. And so they reloaded with shot and they killed a woman. They were acquitted of the murder, tra murder charges, uh, naturally. So long as the soldiers could keep them safe, Parliament ignored the rioters because the Corn Law benefited the landed interest and Parliament represented the landed interest. You notice, no doubt, that Peel was elected by just a few dozen voters. This was not a representative democracy, especially as early industrialization caused cities in the Midlands to grow quickly. Another irony in this story is that it turned out that the Corn Law was unnecessary. Ministers didn't need to worry about a glut of wheat causing prices to fall, especially not in 1816 because a global climate catastrophe destroyed harvests around the Northern Hemisphere. So top left, you've got a typical uh, sunset in 1816 painted by Castro David Friedrich the next year. Uh, you see that sort of yellowish, ashy haze that, that covered uh, large parts of the globe. Uh, bottom left is the eruption of uh, Mount Tambora, which caused uh, this global climate catastrophe. It erupted in April 1815, just as Napoleon was gathering his army in France before Waterloo. Uh, this was the this eruption was larger than any other in recorded human history. It dumped enormous quantities of ash into the atmosphere. It snowed six inches where I am here in Rhode Island uh, in June of 1816, which is uh, unseasonal, as you can imagine. And that's the temperature anomaly in Europe. You can see that in parts of France, it was three degrees Celsius colder than normal uh, on average. So this was the famous year without a summer. Uh, Pambora, uh, sorry, T Peel saw Tambora's effects in Ireland. With no growing season underneath the volcanic ash, there was a terrible famine and a major typhus epidemic in which 1.5 million people got sick and about 65,000 died. But Peel didn't take much action to alleviate the suffering. He explained his inaction as follows. Uh, the government might, in case of extreme necessity, administer relief by direct interference. But if half the population is in this state, we cannot help trembling to think of the consequences of the first precedent. In other words, let's hope that charities take up the slack because we don't want poor people to learn that the government has the capacity to help them. Peel's attitude was in line with the broader conservative philosophy of Liverpool and his cabinet. They were proponents of the laissez-faire school of economics, which is a profession which was just getting started in this period. The government, in their view, should avoid interfering in the economy and indeed society whenever possible. Here you might note that the Corn Law was a direct intervention uh, in the economy, but remember who benefited from it, and also the strategic implications of it. They were worried about Britain starving at, at the next war. Liverpool and Peel also firmly believed in the importance of getting Britain back on the gold standard. Britain had had to leave the gold standard in 1797 in the face of a run on the banks uh, after a minor French landing in Wales that scared everybody silly. A peace after 1815 was the government's chance to reverse that error because paper money was dangerously unreliable in their view. Liverpool appointed Peel to the committee charged with getting back to gold in 1819, which it did, even though not being on the gold standard we now know would have provided Liverpool with much more flexibility to deal with the budget crisis about which I'll have more to say in a moment. So that's our first veteran story. Robert Peel, a new money member of the elite, representative of a rotten borough and champion of the gold standard, who was completely indifferent to the suffering of the poor and the Irish. That sounds like most British politicians in the 19th century, sorry. Uh, but the point here is to say that Peel exemplified the government's approach to the horrible peace. Get out of the way, except maybe to help large landowners or to think sort of big picture strategically. When that didn't work and when riots threatened to turn into revolution, crack down as hard as possible. Uh, more on that in a moment as well. But of course, if you want to learn more about Peel, the politics of demobilization, and the social and economic distress in Britain and Ireland after 1815, it's in the book. Okay, hold on to your hats. I'm going to talk about the Navy for a second. Be patient. It's okay. He's, he's going to interact with the Army, so that's right. Uh, for my second veteran, I'm going to look at an actual veteran. This is Sir Thomas Byam Martin, who came from a naval family. His father had been comptroller of the Navy, meaning head of all its civil departments like the dockyards. One of his older brothers became a wealthy planter and naturally an opponent of the abolition of the slave trade. That's a topic I cover in the book, but I don't have time to do that here. Uh, Thomas Byer Martin joined the Navy as a boy 
and served afloat throughout the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. He won several notable single ship actions, captured lots of privateers, and was a distinguished ship of the line captain in the Baltic. In September 1813, after he'd been promoted to Rear Admiral, Bio Martin went to Spain to help Wellington sort out the sea lines of communication on which his army depended. And that's where he enters my story as Wellington's trusted naval officer. Wellington needed the Navy in Spain, and more specifically, he needed the Navy to do what he wanted it to do. So we need to take the following line with a grain of salt. But it's famous enough, it's worth repeating. Wellington told Bio Martin, if anyone wishes to know the history of this war, I will tell him our maritime superiority gives me the power of maintaining my communications while the enemy is unable to do so. Okay. After the Elba fiasco, Wellington was appointed to command the only British troops anywhere near France, which was a thoroughly mediocre bunch of cast-offs in Germans and Belgium. The Navy, eager perhaps to atone for its mistakes in the Mediterranean, sent by a Martin to Wellington again as his naval liaison. Now, initially, Wellington was confident that little naval assistance would be needed, telling him that he didn't anticipate acting on the defensive. After all, the Allies wildly outnumbered Napoleon. Uh, about, about a million men on the east coast of France, on the eastern border of France. Uh, but as the situation evolved and Napoleon's army grew, Wellington's tone changed. Bayer Martin helped to prepare the defenses of Antwerp and Ostend to ensure that in the event of a disaster, Wellington's army could be removed. Meanwhile, the government pulled troops from everywhere in the empire and unloaded them directly onto the beach at Ostend, which you can see there in red, uh, northwest of Waterloo. It's just 50 kilometers also from Dunkirk, if you need a World War II reference to hang your head on. They stripped Ireland of troops, even though that risked an uprising. They turned around regiments destined for North America, and they hurried up regiments returning from defeat at New Orleans. Byam Martin's job was to organize all that, and he did it remarkably well. The troops that fought at Waterloo were not Britain's finest, but Byam Martin did enough to get Wellington the ammunition and a few veteran battalions that he needed. This episode is a good example of how complicated a simple question like, when did soldiers come home is? Ending a great power war twice, all while ending another war across an ocean, makes for messy deployment patterns. Some of the later chapters on veterans' experiences go into what it was like to find out that Napoleon had returned from Elba while crossing the Atlantic, or what it was like to be two weeks from the end of your enlistment period, only to discover yourself not in Dover like you were promised, but on the beach at Ostend getting ready to fight Napoleon. After his time with Wellington, Bayam Martin became the comptroller of the Navy, just like his father. His responsibilities were vast. He had to prepare the dockyards to receive the fleet, and he also had to figure out which ships to keep and which to sell and which to break up. Worse, he had to do all this in the face of approximately 75% budget cuts to the Navy and 50% budget cuts to the dockyards. That's a real haircut, as you can see on the screen. So that's the, the budget over the course of the decade plus that the book uh, covers. Those budget cuts were that steep because Britain was broke in 1815. The Treasury told the Prime Minister of Liverpool that in 1816, he should expect to spend half of the government's budget on interest payments on the debt. Uh, remember that I mentioned the size of the debt earlier, I'll get to that in a second. But just to show you on the left is UK spending in 1815, basically the government spent money on the military and interest on the debt. Liverpool was told the next year, you're gonna spend half of it just on interest on the debt, right? This is the uh, recent you know, US budget most of it is social spending, even though our social safety net is among the weakest among the, the developed economies. We still, that's mostly what we spend money on and then defense and interest. So if you're spending half of your budget just on the interest on the debt, that's a real uh, chunk of change. Um, and in any case, this was the scale of the debt. So this is a relationship on the left of debt to GDP. And you can see that depending on how you count, uh, the debt to GDP ratio in 1815 was greater than that in the First World War and a little bit less than that in the Second World War, but we're talking comparable scale here. And remember that Liverpool didn't know those numbers, but he did know the number on the right, which is the, just the absolute uh, nominal size of the debt, which shows you the rise in the debt over the course of the wars there at the end. I mean, it's, it's almost a billion pounds, which in 1815 is an astonishing number that's really hard to wrap your, your head around. So the only thing to be done, Liverpool thought, was to slash the military budgets to the bone. The army, remember, that was what the government spent money on, right? So you just cut the military and the interest will you cover the interest and hope the rest uh, gets OK. The army actually got it even worse than the Navy with an 80 percent cut. But the point is, from Bayam Martin's perspective at the Navy, he had an enormous reorganization job. The entire fleet had to be retooled and no money to do it with. 
The result naturally was a collapse in fleet readiness. Uh, this compares, by the way, the U.S. budget cuts in 1945 with British budget cuts in 1815. It really was like ending the scale of this of the Second World War. So the fleet readiness collapsed. For sloops and frigates, the simplest thing to do was to sell them or break them up because theoretically they could be rebuilt quickly in the event of another war. So Bio Martin sold 374 smaller ships and ordered 178 to be broken up. The capital ships, the big ships of the line, were harder. The Admiralty told Bio Martin that they wanted to have 100 ships of the line available in peacetime, of which 80 would be in mothballs or in ordinary, uh, to be re uh, put back into service if there was another war. But there were so many ships in such bad states of disrepair and no capacity in the dockyards to deal with them that in 1817, there were just 59 ships of the line that could plausibly be ready, uh, be made ready for service. A year later, that number dropped to 37. Remember that ships, of course, decay in salt water. And the end of the wars did not mean world peace. There were plenty of competitors still out there, including, and perhaps especially, the United States. The War of 1812 resolved nothing. The peace treaty restored relations to the status quo antebellum. So the threat of war after 1815 was real. And on the Great Lakes, both sides engaged in a significant arms race. Uh, so this is a picture of the partially built USS New Orleans, which was supposed to be a ship of the line built on the Great Lakes. Uh, it was never completed. That's a picture from the 1880s, so sorry for the poor quality, but it's always cool to see a picture from of an actual ship of the line. Uh, Bayon Martin looked at British preparations on the Great Lakes and warned the Admiralty that they were losing. The British ships, quote, dilapidated state made them entirely unprepared for any hostile movement on the part of the Americans, he said. In 1815, the British Navy had been almost as large as the rest of the world's navies put together. In other words, it had what you call a global standard. In 1820, Bayon Martin warned the Admiralty that it would be eight to nine years before the Royal Navy had even a two-power standard. Andrew Lambert, the naval historian, has called Bayon Martin the, quote, most able comptroller in the Navy's history. But even Bayon Martin's remarkable skills weren't enough. The fleet had 90 ships of the line in 1830, which was quite a turnaround. But remember that the goal had been 100 in 1815. So the result in the collapse of the fleet's readiness was that Britain behaved passively in the post-war decade, but not because it was following some policy of strategic restraint like John Eikenberry thinks. Britain behaved passively because it had no other choice. Instead, the British encouraged negotiations that led to the world's first arms limitation agreement, the rush Bego Pact, which slowed the arms race on the Great Lakes. That's a fascinating story, as is the Royal Navy's failure to deal with pirates in the Caribbean. Uh, but I don't have time to go into detail here. All this weakness lasted until the middle of the 1820s, which is when, when I begin to wind my story down. Uh, one useful event that puts a bookend on the post-war slump is that in 1824, the Navy deployed a steam vessel in combat for the first time first against Algiers, and then later that year in Burma. So it seems to me that only then can we start to see the kind of global power projection that people usually think of when they think of the British Navy in the 19th century. My focus, though, is mostly on the decade of dockyard chaos, rotten ships, and widespread unemployment for both officers and sailors. Uh, and as always, the book has more. I should probably talk about some soldiers. Let's talk soldiers. Okay. So for my final veteran today, I'm going to talk about an enlisted soldier. I had lots to choose from, especially because from the group that got out in 1814 or 1815, right as the wars ended. So the redundantly named artilleryman Alexander, Alexander, for example, helps me illustrate several themes in the book, including his dissatisfaction with his pension, his shame at having served as an enlisted man, despite being fairly well educated, and his enthusiasm for seeking his fortune in the empire. Uh, but you'll have to read the book to learn about him. Today, I want to talk about a different soldier to illustrate different themes, and that's Troop Sergeant uh, William Dawes. So Dawes joined a cavalry regiment in 1806 after seeing a recruiting poster in London. He first saw real action in 1809 during Sir John, sorry, during Sir John Moore's doom campaign in Spain that ended with the retreat to Corona. Uh, he returned to the Iberian Peninsula the next year and fought with Wellington all the way through to the Battle of Toulouse in 1814, which is where he learned that the war had ended the first time. After a few months in Ireland, he was one of those redeployed to Belgium to bolster Wellington's army before Waterloo, which he participated in and survived. I care about Dawes uh, because both before and after Waterloo, he was stationed around the British Isles to keep the peace. One of the points I emphasize in the second half of the book is the large presence on the British army of the British army on domestic soil in the post-war years. The government needed to deploy the army to prevent a revolution. 
I already mentioned the Cornwall riots, but there were many more. The Spafield riots, the East Anglian bread riots, the Pentridge Rising, the Blanketeers March, and that's just in England and just in 1816 and 1817. So in chapter 12 in the book, I compare the experiences of demobilized so soldiers who participated in the riots with still mobilized soldiers who were called out to put the riots down. Soldiers lent their expertise to both sides of the brewing British rebellion. On the protester side, soldiers trained them to march in formation, respond to signals transmitted by drums and clapping, and even fight back by arming themselves with farm weaponry. On the army side, men like Dawes were not trained for crowd control. They had no non-lethal weapons, so it was hard to create a viable escalation ladder, to borrow a political science term. Right? Often soldiers shifted suddenly from showing up and looking intimidating, if that didn't work, then they might open fire directly. It was hard to escalate. The most famous example of that is a massacre at Peterloo in August 1819, in which hundreds of protesters were injured and dozens were killed by a combination of amateur yeomanry and professional troops, including members of Dawes's own regiment, who overreacted to a peaceful meeting. Uh, in his memoir, Dawes describes the challenges that veterans of the Peninsular War, fa Peninsular War faced in adapting to these situations. When he was deployed to Ireland in 1814, after two years of intense fighting in Fran Spain and France, he said his regiment, quote, calculated upon reposing in quiet and restoring to order and condition the wear and tear inseparable from the checkered and knocked about existence of the last two years. That's 19th century speak for basically they're looking forward to a vacation. Instead, though, they were at the beck and call of civil authorities, called out several times a week in detachments of 10 to 12 men, usually late at night. They chased down highway robbers, so crime spiked in the five years after Waterloo. They responded to riots, and they worked to break up incipient rebellions against British rule. In other words, they were doing counterinsurgency work. Uh, Dawes recalled the continuance and endurance of this vexatious and harassing life was becoming intolerable. Troops became increasingly angry at the lack of results, but he said we were doomed to grin and bear it. An artillerymen remembered what it was like to wear a British uniform in Ireland. He said, as soldiers, we were hated and despised, insulted and loaded with the foulest epithets. In our different billets looked upon and received as if we had carried pestilence, robbery and pillage with us. Not only did soldiers hate the work, but they were also bad at it. Clearly there needed to be an organization less focused on lethality and more focused on law and order. In other words, the police. The first regular armed police force dates from exactly this period. It was technically called the Royal Irish Constabulary, but everyone called them Bobbies or Peelers after their creator, our very own Robert Peel. Peel also created the London Metropolitan Police seven years later in 1829, and the name was transferred. Many police officers were veterans, which is still true today, of course. As I said, the book spends a lot of time on the mechanics and the optics of all this, from the regimental rotations that tried to keep soldiers from getting stuck in miserable counterinsurgency work, to how veterans found themselves on the receiving end of blows from soldiers wearing their Waterloo medals, as happened at Peterloo. But I want to stick with our friendly troop sergeant for a bit uh, to follow him out of the army. Uh, when Dawes reached 21 years service, he became eligible for a pension, and he decided after much hemming and hawing that he should take it and get out. However, when the fateful day came, he later wrote, I very soon became like a fish out of water. He's a soldier, whatever. I became like a fish out of water and sighed for activity. Ennui was beginning to creep in, accompanied by a threatened attack of the blues. He returned to his hometown but the war wouldn't leave him. Every field and stream he crossed reminded him of, quote, the identical spot on which a battle had been fought. To give himself a purpose, Dawes decided to get rid of the roots of a dead oak tree. He took advantage of his military training to shorten the job. He procured some explosives and he tried to blow up the stump. If you ever try to get rid of a stump, right, it's really hard, but maybe you blow it up, that'll work. Uh, his experience, however, as a cavalryman proved to be uh, less than helpful with handling explosives. And uh, basically it blew up before he was, he was ready. Uh, he said he adopted the position resorted to when a shell is expected to explode near a carcass. I believe that the explosion gave rise to strange impressions among the village gossips and the unsophisticated tongues wagged and whisperings enunciated doubts as to the sanity of the person just returned from the army. Eventually he did dig, dig up the roots, but victory in the battle of the oak stump left him once again adrift. He decided to visit his old regiment and he immediately said he felt more at home in the few hours I remained inside the barrack walls than I had since I left the service. I can't tell you whether Dawes had PTSD because I shouldn't retroactively diagnose him based on his memoir. Dawes obviously didn't know what PTSD was. He would have likely described how he was feeling as a form of nostalgia, right? A desire to rejoin his surrogate home, perhaps mixed with melancholia. 
both were common diagnoses in the aftermath and the point of the Napoleonic Wars. Nostalgia derives from the Greek nostos, which means homecoming. It's what Odysseus, the archetypal veteran, seeks throughout the Odyssey. Dawes' feelings of homelessness, he's at home only with his regiment, was and is another common condition of veteranhood. Now, not all who were nostalgic suffer from PTSD, but his recollections display an overwrought version of the competing emotional pressures that all soldiers and sailors experienced to some degree as they demobilized. So there's lots more. Of course, I don't have time to talk about uh, what was it like to be demobilized? What was it like to try to find a job in the post-war slump? What the options were for careers in the empire and many more subjects uh, that weren't in my talk today. I hope you check out the book if you're interested. Uh, to wrap up though, I thought I'd offer just a few thoughts on the contribution I hope the book makes. Historians need to think, well, first, I already mentioned the Army-Navy crossover thing. I think that's important. But I also think periodization is something to think about. We need to think carefully about how we periodize our stories. That seems obvious, and it probably is. But what I learned in writing this book is that when you write across traditional boundaries, you gain new perspectives. 1815 is certainly a traditional boundary. As I say in the abstract for the book, before 1815, there was Napoleon and global war. After 1815, there was the Pax Britannica. I could give you dozens of examples of books that begin or end in 1815 or that skip over the aftermath of Waterloo. Of course, I've even been guilty of this. There's my first book. I've got three book plugs in one talk, and I even wrote two of them. Uh, but there are costs when we do that. When the Navy Record Society published three volumes of the papers of Sir Thomas Byam Martin, the second volume ended in 1815 after Byam Martin's time with Wellington. The third volume starts in 1822. The post-war readiness crisis, in which Byam Martin was a central figure, was left entirely blank, but not because of a lack of sources. I had to go track them all down in the British Library. That's not the only case of especially military and naval historians giving the years of retrenchment, budget cuts, and passivity short shrift. I hope that my book helps remedy some of those kinds of oversights. I don't think we can understand the Napoleonic Wars without continuing the story past 1815. When we go past 1815, we call into question some of our assumptions about Britain's great triumph. Yes, Britain led the world into the 19th century, but it took longer than most have assumed for that lead to translate into hard power. That's because of the war's enormous costs, both in lives and money, and because of the transition costs they imposed even on the victorious sides. We can talk about how Europe is not doing great either, but it's still important to highlight that Britain is not triumphantly striding boldly into the, into the 19th century. When we do look at the post-war years, we find a country teetering on the brink of revolution. There are lots of parallels between Britain in the 1790s when the government cracked down on revolutionary ideology from France and Britain in the decade after Waterloo. In both cases, the government survived, but it was, to return again to Wellington, a near-run thing. Thanks. Dudley, I am done talking. Thank you, Evan. Um, let me just take down your slides. Um, it's always good to have the chairman of the society in the audience um, and also to have the, the treasurer here. And of course, Rowan has reminded me that uh, we make these talks available to uh, everybody, not just members of the society, uh, and we make no charge for it. Um, but if you have enjoyed the talk this evening and would like to make a donation, uh, then please go and visit the Society's uh, website uh, where you can find a donation page. Um, Evan, I learned so much this evening. Uh, that was a really enjoyable talk. Thank you very much indeed. Um, this is not my period of history. Uh, and of course, I am um, a military, not a naval historian. Um, but once again, uh, the need for the, for the two branches to talk to each other is oh so evident. Um, right, we do have some questions. Um, and, but before we do that, um, we promised a link to your book. So um, let's put that up. So um, if you you can see that you can download a link and that will have the, the code that Evan spoke to you about. Um, he also said that he would welcome anyone contacting him, and I took him at his word. So I've put uh, your email address, Evan, into the um, into the chat box as we as we did the talk. So that now leads me to some of the questions that have come in, um, and the first one is from um, Frederick. 
He's asked, do you think that the post-Waterloo soldiers saved Britain from the kind of revolution that parts of Europe experienced? Was that serendipity or were the soldiers well trained to convert to being an internal security force? Thanks for the question. Thanks for all the uh, questions in the chat and, and thank you doubly for the opportunity to do this. This was uh, a lot of fun. I'm, I'm glad uh, you learned something, but um, hopefully we can continue the conversation. So let me take the second part of that question first. Were the soldiers well trained to convert to being an internal security force? Absolutely not. They had, uh, as I mentioned briefly, soldiers um, had a lot of crowd control responsibilities because there weren't many options for local authorities between when, when something bad happened between hiring a bunch of constables on the spot to try to deal with the crisis and calling in the army. So the army got called in frequently because it was often the only available force that the state had to deploy in the event of a riot or some sort of demonstration or something that they, they were worried about. And so soldiers would get called out to these, uh, these, uh, you know, difficult situations. And they sort of unofficially developed a kind of doctrine for how to deal with them, but you, it was never really written down. And it was never something that was that they trained for because that was not their primary purpose, right? Their primary purpose was uh, to go fight Britain's enemies. And technically speaking, the British public was not uh, Britain's enemies. So you they would show up first. And sometimes if they just showed up and looked imposing with, you know, the, the uniform and the, the horses and the rifles and all the rest of it, that was enough to, to break up the crowd, but often that didn't work. So then they usually had to stand around for a while and maybe guard something. Uh, or uh, So if you look at, for example, the Boston Massacre is a good example of this. The soldiers there who are involved in the massacre are guarding the customs house in Boston. That's what they're there to do. But all that means is that they're just a sitting target for people to throw stuff at. And so basically the rioters then just pelt them with you know vegetables or worse, like stones and brick bracks and and all these other horrible things. And so the soldiers have to take it. So then the next thing you could do is you could form up in a line and you could maybe advance on the crowd, but that got dicey pretty quickly, right? Are you gonna point a bayonet right into the crowd and start actually killing people? That That's an issue. So they might try to then fire over the crowd, but with an 18th century musket firing over the crowd, somebody's gonna get hurt. And that usually is what happens. And so they are, they're not trained for it. They're not good at it. They don't like doing it but they're often the only uh, response. So it's hard to credit them with keeping Britain from having a revolution either in the 1790s or in the 18 teens. And yet Britain didn't have a revolution in the 1790s or in the 18 teens. So it's also hard to say, well, they made it worse. I think you have to give the government credit like the crackdown worked. That's not necessarily to you know say that we should be enthusiastic about how it all went down. A lot of people died, but the government's harsh crackdown, the, you know, sedition acts, the banning of these, uh, you know, large meetings and all these other things that they did, did actually prevent a revolution in Britain, or at least it didn't cause a revolution in Britain. Maybe that's a, the, the most that we can say, even if it wasn't a, a positive uh, uh, contribution towards it. So um, I, I don't think that the soldiers after Waterloo should deserve credit for preventing the revolution themselves. They didn't want it. They weren't good at it. That wasn't something they wanted to do. But Britain didn't have a revolution. So we have to be able to explain that. And one way to explain it is, well, it could have gone worse. And so um, that's that's what I've got. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Luke's asked, in reference to Dawes, he clearly missed his regiment and the purpose, but to tie it to the rest of the talk, does he talk about if he can indeed survive on his pension? Luke, is this a test? I know, Luke. Haven't you heard this before? All right, Luke. All right, fine, Luke. Uh, okay, so uh, does Dawes specifically talk about whether he can survive on his pension? I honestly, I don't remember. I can send you the memoir, and you can you can check it out yourself. I think the reason he quits after 21 years is in part because he does the math and realizes that it doesn't make any sense to stay in financially, so he should just get out. And that would be, he's tired, he's done with it, he feels like it's, it's ready to go and he can probably make ends meet uh, afterwards. So, uh, but he's at the 21 year mark. And so for that calculus is more unusual than the usual calculus that soldiers have, which is about the seven year enlistment mark. Those are the ones that get out and get very meager pensions. And all of the memoirs of the seven year guys talk about that they can't survive on the pension. And in fact, the government didn't design the pensions for them to survive on them. They're deliberately not meant to be, okay, you don't have to work again. The pensions are instead designed ideally as 
basically drinking money. And I, I don't mean that facetiously. The soldiers that seem to have adapted best to the pension system after the wars were the ones who managed to find employment, which was often really hard because it wasn't always clear what a soldier's skills were when he went back into the job market. And if he's an agricultural laborer and he goes back to the Tambora global climate catastrophe, the chance of getting a job is slim. But let's say you get a job on a farm and you, you establish yourself as a successful you know, uh, agricultural laborer for a few years. Your pension, you'd collect it maybe once a quarter and you and your buddies would go into town and get rip roaring drunk and have a grand all time and then come back. And that would be what the pension would sort of be there for, for the seven year men. It was not intended to be survival money. And the government was very clear about that because of course, if it was supposed to be something that you could survive on, then no one would ever work again. So they made it, they, they very deliberately calculated it to be a supplement to the income, but not enough to live on. The exceptions of the men who are in for 20 plus years, or who get uh, a, a very nice pension for a wound. So you go to Greenwich, you go to Chelsea, you go in front of a board, maybe you can play some sympathetic cards and because you lost an arm, you get a big uh, fat pension, but they're very inconsistent about that. It takes them a long time to come up with regulations for, well, one arm equals this much money and you know one leg equals that much money. So uh, pensions are not supposed to be live forever on them in most cases, thanks. I think that's probably a very good um, PhD there, isn't it? Um, yeah. Pension policies. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Jim said, thank you, Evan, for a very interesting talk and subject. Are there any sources or views of the experience of Irish, for Irish former soldiers and officers returning to Ireland in the context of divided loyalties and the reception they may have received? And, and Jim's in Dublin at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Probably. I don't know. I wasn't specifically looking to unpack the Irish experience after the wars. I did look at the British Army there as a counterinsurgency force, but I was mostly focused on the ones that stayed on active duty, not the ones that, that, that went back to Ireland, to Ireland. So it wasn't a question that I asked specifically. But this book is the first, as far as I know, the first study of demobilization in the Napoleonic Wars. And part of the point of writing it this way was to open up questions exactly like that that I think deserve more research. So uh, that's a great question that someone could could examine, uh, but I wasn't able to answer it specifically myself. Uh, Richards asked the question, was the post-war radicalism of some demobilized enlisted men mirrored in the demobilized officer class? So yes, uh, the it's really hard to draw clear lines here. Uh, but there are certainly large conservative or large group of conservative officers who uh, absolutely supported the crackdown after the war, no doubt about that. There are also, however, radical officers. And so uh, it's not hard to find them. They often get in a lot of trouble. Uh, so uh, the guy with first name I'm forgetting, Wilson, who ends up in Spain, uh, gets involved with the Queen Charlotte's funeral and the um, Robert Wilson uh, is a good example of a radical officer like that. On the naval side, it's Lord Cochrane is a famous example. So there are certainly radical officers. I would be surprised if we could ever figure this out, if you found as many uh, radical officers as officers who supported the crackdown, but that's not to say that they didn't exist. Niels asked, how systematic and objective was the process for selecting naval and army units for extinction or reduction? It was as systematic as the 1815 administrative state could make it. Um, so they thought about it very carefully. They had a plan and then they ran into the limits of their own abilities and power. On the naval side, that often meant they ran into the what happened when they pulled up the planking on a frigate and discovered that the entire ship was rotten and you had to be condemned. So the frigate was planned to be kept. It was going to be refurbished. Turns out, can't keep it, got to get rid of it. Same, same, same thing with a lot of the ships of the line. So the Navy certainly had a plan and they had a plan for the, the readiness stats that I gave you in there about they had 100 ships, they wanted 100 ships of the line, they had 57, then they had 30, 59, then 37, whatever it was. Um, those are indicative not of a failure to plan, they're indicative of reality of the state of the fleet. On the army side, it's a little easier in the sense that you can look at the list of regiments and the list of uh, battalions for each regiment and say, well, this regiment no longer needs a second battalion or a third battalion or a fourth battalion in some cases. And so they can eliminate those pretty, uh, pretty deliberately. A lot of times you just eliminate a battalion and squish them back together and say, there's just the one battalion of the regiment now. So that was one way to go about it without actually deleting regiments from the list. 
though some regiments were deleted. Um, so they definitely had a, a plan for that. It's a little easier on the army side because you aren't as surprised about the state of a regiment when you go investigate it. You just get the returns of say, this is how many men we have, right? Whereas with a ship, you often don't really know how rotten a ship is until you actually go explore the inside of it. So uh, yes, they tried carefully to think about it deliberately, but it was very difficult to actually pull off uh, in, a, in a smooth and uh, an, an easy way. Yeah, this is standard practice for the army. War's finished, regiments go. That's right. um, it's called the peace dividend. That's right. Um, Andrew has asked, um, thank you for a very lucid talk. I was wondering what factors allowed Britain's Navy, Army and finances to recover from the period of 1815 to 25. And when exactly did the recovery begin? So uh, it's hard to answer that question with the kind of authority that you would want me to answer it. So I'm going to say everything I'm about to say, just take it with a, a couple of grains of salt. But um, part of this is you remove so much spending from the economy in the 1815, 16, 17 period as the budget cuts really hit, the economy slumps and you don't therefore have as big a tax base and therefore it's hard to then have the economy recover uh, the way you would want it to in the, the in the 1820s. So that's one thing that's happening is that the government is taking itself as much as it can out of the economy, and that definitely may, has an impact on its ability to then recover from it quickly. Uh, another thing that's happening though is that uh, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution are happening, and so there are the population is growing rapidly. There are signs of growth in lots of different industries, and so by the middle of the 1820s, which is usually when people start to really see the Industrial Revolution, that uh, we would recognize as an industrial revolution, that's going to provide the engine that then drives Britain's economy in the, in the 19th century. Some of that is government intervention, and some of that is just because that's what's happening in Britain for reasons that you can read a thousand books about, and I don't have time uh, to summarize here. Um, so I usually, I, I found that by about 1825, uh, that's the first time when I saw... Uh, no, he's system. frozen. Okay. Is that just me or is that Evan? I see you frozen, Dudley, if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. Can anyone else hear me? Evan, you froze and I, I refreshed myself, but we're back again. Okay. Does that destroy your flow? No, that's all right. I can just answer real quickly with one other thing, which is that I think in the book, when uh, the Anglo-Burmese War of 1824 to 26, they actually have spare regiments in Britain and they send them to Burma. And that to me is a sign of a different approach to foreign policy that you hadn't seen in the previous 10 years, when basically they said to the United States and Canada, like, just get out of the way. We're not, we want peace at all costs. That's the state of policy. But by 1824, they say, no, no, we're gonna go fight this war in Burma. And we have regiments in the home in the home you know islands to send to go do it and that to me is an indication that things have really uh, turned over so i bring the book to a close sometime in the 1824 25 26 range because i think that's when you can see the the turnaround what i quite like about these talks is that um the audience helps you out with some of the answers to the questions that are being posed and your friend luke has helped pablo with part of this um pablo asked a question and I'll give you Luke's answer as well at the same time. Um, thank you very much for the erudite conference. Is there any work that you can suggest about the presence of Irish and English soldiers who have sought better fortune in the emancipation processes of South America, to which Luke suggested that he might like to look at um, Rodriguez Freedom's mercenaries, British volunteers in the wars of independence of Latin America? So that's Luke's contribution to help you out with the question, Evan, but you probably have your own answer. Uh, I do, though the name is escaping me at the moment. I would just say, I'm happy to answer that question over email. There are other books like that. Luke has mentioned one of them. There are about two more. Uh, some of them are about adventurers and they, they sort of treat it that way. Um, and others are uh, sort of doctoral dissertation style of approaches to it. But if you send me an email, I'm happy to, to, to provide you some more answers, but thank you, Luke, for that uh, assist. Um, it's a very, it's a fascinating story, and there's lots of uh, articles about us too. So, for example, all these 
arms that aren't needed in Europe anymore flow to South America. And it's among the reasons why the revolutions uh, flare up again so dramatically after 1815 is suddenly there are guns everywhere. Um, so uh, it's a it's a great start subject and I'm happy to answer over email. Thanks. Yeah, that was a brilliant answer. I like that. Um, because of course, the Monroe Doctrine starts to develop around this time as well. Oh boy, it? there is a topic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, one last question. It comes from Neil. Um, many of the demobilized regulars had originally been drafted from the militia. How far did the government trust the militia to maintain domestic security? Good question. I don't have a particularly satisfying answer. I would say it depends. But also, uh, in general, regular troops were more reliable and they saw them that way and they would they were the ones that get called out. They start to build a lot of barracks inland to help solve this problem. So a lot of barracks get built in the north uh, during the, the first decade of the 19th century. And I think um, that's an indication that they need regular troops on hand for when things go wrong. Um, so I, I would uh, say that this is not a question that I spent a ton of time with, uh, but in general, regular troops are generally seen as more reliable, even though, I mean, to, again, they weren't trained for it and it wasn't something that they wanted to do. And the government didn't really want them to do it either, but there wasn't a better option. And until the police forces really get online in the 20s and the 30s, you don't you don't see them with, with many other tools at their disposal. Well, thank you for not only a fascinating talk, Evan, but a very, very succinct and erudite response to the questions uh, that have been posed this evening. Um, as I said to you when we started the Q&A session, I learned a hell of a lot from your talk. It's always nice to be told by um, an American about my own history uh, and, and well, and, and to learn so much. So that is brilliant. Um, the, uh, the book is, uh, the handout uh, is there for those that are interested in Evan's book. Um, the treasures plea that you uh, all might like to make a, a small donation to the, uh, to the society's coffers is also uh, there in the, in the chat. Um, our next talk is in February. Uh, we have not yet set a date, but uh, it will be pub publicized on the Society's website. Uh, and for, um, uh, sorry, Evan, you might like to open up the chat box so that you can see. I can that, see it. Uh, people That's are, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, a reminder that uh, whether you attended the live session or whether uh, you're watching this on recording, uh, the recording always goes out within a few hours of the end of the talk and certainly should be in your in trays by first thing tomorrow morning. If it's not, then please send me an email and I'll make certain that you get a copy of it. So Evan, once again, on behalf of the Society, thank you very much indeed for making time um, to see us. I, I'm certain you told me that you didn't sail. Uh, and when you tell me that the storms are coming in to Rhode Island, my Rhode Island, I think you're probably in the best place in your study, um, away from the young children. <laughs> uh, we've enjoyed your company and um, to everybody, thank you very much indeed and see you next month. Thanks so much, Abbe. I really appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye.